Regrettably, passenger planes have been shot down. Such events are unfortunately not relegated to the confines of aviation history because as recently as 2020, civilian planes have been shot down in either acts of aggression or by pure accident. Perhaps one of the most peculiar instances of a shoot-down event came in 1978. A passenger plane belonging to Korean Airlines was intercepted and fired upon by the Soviet Union. Flying as Flight 902, the Boeing 707 left Paris for a long flight to Seoul with 109 occupants on board. Their route that day should have kept them well away from the Soviet Union, but still the USSR saw it was necessary to intervene. But why? This incident is not to be confused with Korean Airlines Flight 7, which was also shot down by the Soviet Union in 1983, killing 269 people. Korean Airlines Flight 902 was an incident which not only demonstrated a major navigational error, but also demonstrated a quirk of not the plane, but the planet as a whole. The events of this incident begin at Paris's Orly Airport. A Boeing 707 belonging to Korean Airlines left the airport at 1.39 p.m. local time on April 20th, 1978. 107 passengers and crew were making the trip that day. On the flight deck was Captain Kim Chang-kyu, the co-pilot Cha soon do and sitting in the flight engineer's position was Lee Kun-shik. He was also assuming the position of navigator the plane they were flying was an 11-year-old Boeing 707. The 707 was one of the first passenger jet planes to fly and be commercially successful. The plane could fly faster, higher, and further than any of the prop liners that came before it. The navigational instruments of the time and the equipment that was installed on this plane were certainly ancient when compared to modern systems. The route that Flight 902 took out of Paris was not east towards Asia, but rather north. During the Cold War, airspace over Russia was restricted. This forced many airlines to deviate around the massive country, which posed a problem for airlines flying between Europe and Asia. As was commonplace during this time, planes flew north. In the case of Korean Airlines 902, the 707 flew over England, passing east of the Scottish mainland, over the Shetland and Faroe Islands, where it would cross the Norwegian Sea in a northeasterly direction towards northern Greenland. The plane was to pass very close to the magnetic North Pole. Once doing so, Flight 902 would head in a southerly direction towards Alaska. Many flights made stopovers in Anchorage, Alaska to refuel before continuing on to various destinations across Asia. Some airlines even used this route to get to Oceania. Once the airspace was open following the collapse of the USSR, this routing became redundant and obsolete. This route was supposed to keep aircraft well away from Soviet-controlled airspace, and it usually did. However, the case of Flight 902 would suggest otherwise. So what happened? Our planet's North Pole can have multiple ways in which it can be defined. The geographic North Pole is often what people think of first, and is simply defined as the top of the planet. The magnetic North Pole is different and can even shift. The contents of the Earth's core helps to produce an electromagnetic field around the planet. Stretching out from the core, this field helps to protect the planet from violent solar activity. The standard compass works by interacting with this magnetic field to determine which direction is north. The same compass technology was used on Flight 902. Because the magnetic north pole is defined from within the Earth itself, it is prone to shifting. In 1978, at the time of the Korean Air incident, the magnetic north pole was close to Ellesmere Island in the very far north of Canada some several hundred kilometers from the geographic North Pole. As the Boeing 707 passed over Greenland heading towards Ellesmere Island, the crew would have had to start readjusting and calibrating their compasses and navigational equipment. Rolling to adjust for course corrections was inevitable. Flight 902 passed over the Canadian outpost of Alert, located on the north coast of Ellesmere Island. According to one source, the weather outside that day was clear, with some scattered clouds. Flight 902 made contact with Alert 5 hours and 21 minutes after leaving Paris to check in with a standard radio message. Not long after this communication, the plane would appear to do something highly unusual. There was no radar coverage this far north, therefore the plane could not be tracked by radar. 
but it was pieced together that the Korean Airlines plane then turned to the right. This was likely due to erroneous interpretations of the gyrocompass-driven navigation systems. The 707 turned to head southeast. The large right turn had put the plane on a heading towards Russia. The pilots clearly did not notice, and the plane began flying in almost the opposite direction it was supposed to. If using a compass, the crew would expect the North Pole to now be behind them, which it was, but flying in a completely different direction. The heading data in the plane was likely affected by the shift in magnetics, giving the pilots the impression that they were going the right way. It was not long before the plane began passing over the Svalbard archipelago. Svalbard is politically under Norwegian jurisdiction. However, Russia and the Soviet Union was also involved on the islands. It is unknown whether the plane was picked up by Russian outposts on Svalbard. Flight 902 continued its unintended journey southeast, where it was first spotted by Soviet military around 400 kilometers from its territorial waters. To them, it would appear that the plane was on course to pass over the city of Murmansk, close to the Russian-Finnish border. The plane was intercepted at 8.54 p.m. by a Russian Sukhoi Su-15 jet, piloted by a man named Alexander Bosov. The Russian plane was spotted by the flight crew and some passengers. Air traffic controllers stationed in Rovaniemi, Finland, heard Captain Kim chang Kyu making attempts to contact the Russian jet on the 121.5 emergency frequency, where they received no response. Once intercepted, Alexander Bosov piloting the Su-15 would roll the wings of their plane in a maneuver which was supposed to be an internationally recognized signal to follow the intercepting plane. The Russian pilot, however, according to Captain Kim chang Kyu, did not perform the correct maneuver, which was supposed to be done on the plane's left, whereas on this occasion, Bosov approached from the right. Passengers in the cabin would also state after the incident that they could see the Russian plane flying alongside them, but none noted the plane waggling its wings or flashing its lights. The flight crew of Korean Airlines 902 then turned again to the right towards the border with Finland, as they may have now realized where they actually were. Tensions rose further as according to one source, the Su-15 pilot Alexander Bosov apparently noted that the plane's tail fin was decorated with a maple leaf, suggesting that the plane was actually a Canadian military plane. This would mean a NATO plane had entered Soviet airspace. He actually had mistaken the logo used by Korean Airlines at the time for that of a maple leaf. The captain of Flight 902 flashed the navigation lights of the 707 as a sort of indication to cooperate. Despite this, the maneuver the plane took to the right was also interpreted by the Russians as an evasive action of not wanting to follow the interceptor. The Sukhoi jet had now been following Flight 902 for 15 minutes. Bosov, along with another pilot, Vladimir Tsarkov, soon identified it as a civilian plane and tried to convince their superiors that the plane was not a military threat. The 707 was now heading towards Finnish airspace. At their current speed with the distance to the border, the Russian commanders had just six minutes to determine a course of action. Despite Bosov's efforts, he received instructions to shoot it down. He then fired two P-60 heat-seeking rockets at the passenger plane. The first of the two rockets missed, but the second damaged part of the left wing and a section of the aircraft's skin. When the rocket exploded, Shrapnel penetrated the fuselage and cabin, killing a Korean passenger sat in row 23 by the name of Pang Tsai Huang, a 36-year-old salesman from Seoul. A Japanese passenger, 31-year-old Kafeyona Yoshitako Sugano, was seated behind them in row 24 in the window seat. He was severely injured by the blast. His brothers, also seated nearby, were also injured. Though the plane was damaged, it was still controllable, and the flight crew immediately descended to a lower altitude one source stating that the plane was put into a nosedive to achieve this. The plane soon disappeared from Soviet radar screens and the 707 descended below the clouds. The section of the left wing which broke from the plane was perceived to be a cruise missile by the Russians and so they dispatched another aircraft to the air, however they could not find the plane. Korean Airlines Flight 902 made a forced landing at dusk in the Russian region of Karelia after over an hour in the air looking for a suitable place to put the plane down. The flight crew made multiple forced landing attempts as the plane was still controllable. 
they settled the plane down on a frozen lake outside of the Russian town of Lui. Yoshitako Sugano, the injured Japanese passenger, died from bleeding out once the plane landed. Aside from the two passengers killed from the initial rocket blast, there were no other fatalities. It was air traffic control in Anchorage, Alaska, who first noted the plane to be missing, as it had not checked in and was long overdue. The Soviet Union, unsurprisingly, did not cooperate internationally. Many of the passengers thought that the crisis had started over Alaska. Imagine their shock for a moment when they realized that they had actually landed in the Soviet Union. Though the survivors were sent to a nearby town and flown to Helsinki on a Pan Am plane, the captain and flight engineer were detained by Soviet officials. The 707 itself was dismantled and the black boxes seized. The Russians found nothing on board the plane to be nefarious, no military or reconnaissance equipment, just a passenger plane. The flight crew blamed their navigational equipment for the massive change in course, but had admitted guilt in violating Soviet airspace. Leonid Brezhnev, the leader of the Soviet Union, pardoned and expelled the pilots from the country. No punishment was ever given to the commanders who gave the orders to shoot down Flight 902, or to the pilot who pulled the trigger. Five years later, on September 1st, 1983, the Soviet Union shot down another Korean Airlines passenger plane, this time a 747 carrying 269 passengers and crew. That incident occurred on the other side of Russia, in the far east of the country. That too was shot down by an Su-15 interceptor, which killed everyone on board. Hello everyone, I hope you are having a good day wherever you are in the world. If you found this video to be interesting, be sure to subscribe as there is always a new video every Saturday. I don't want to say too much just yet, but in the background, I am working on a pretty big video covering multiple incidents that I believe are all tied together. If all goes well, it could be a 45 minute plus video. No release date just yet though. Anyway, it's that time of the week where I must thank my patrons over on Patreon for the amazing support. If you would like to have your name featured here or read out at the end of the next video, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from £3 per month and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. Patrons also get early access to all new content 48 hours before it goes out publicly on YouTube. So a thank you to my five pound tier patrons, Avery Tioda, Hunter Heilman, Hector Palmatellas, Joey, John Ambrosia, Ken Zachman, Kenneth Morins, Christy, Leon San Jennings, Marie Ennis, MG, Mom Left Me at Best Buy, Pac-Man 7, Panic Chicken, Pedro Cruz, Rebecca Rivers, Rez, Rio Wheatley, Saria Melody, Sleepy, So FP, Suso Su Shoes, and Tristan Kriegsman. I hope I pronounced that right. A big thank you to my £10 tier patrons for their generous support Aidan Montgomery, Anne Sid, Bard Ghost Isu, Derek Bean, Epsilon, Aaron Wilson, Extreme Brooklyn Accent, James Bluke, Karma, Mike Milton, Roger Mayer, Steve Cottrell, Vapronva, who is a new joiner and literally just got in before I rendered this video, and to where are my Cheetos. Thank you all so much. That is it for me this week. I hope you have a good weekend, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.